inviting me. So considering what is happening in Ukraine at the moment, it's not easy to focus your attention on science, but I will um, do my best to focus your attention on the white matter and my attention. And um, um, I will be talking about the role of microglia in the development and in aging and in uh, remyelination um, of the white matter. I will go back in history. 1854, Rudolf Virchow was the first one to describe the white matter, the marrow of the brain, and he compared it to the yolk of an egg. So he thought that um, the marrow was secreted by neurons and did not contain of any uh, cells. It was only uh, 20 years later when Ortega um, discovered the main uh, cellular component of the white matter, the oligodendrocytes. So he used the silver carbonate uh, staining uh, techniques, uh, which uh, stained, um, he called it the third element after the first and the second element, which are the neurons and the astrocytes. So the third element were oligodendrocytes and microglia together. So the staining at that time could not distinguish between these two cells. And he also didn't know at that time that um, oligodendrocytes are the cells that uh, produce myelin. So today with electron microscopy, we can nicely visualize um, myelin. And you can see this on the right, um, the typical multi-layered structure um, of um, myelin. And it's a major component of the white matter. So here you see um, a sagittal section of a brain autopsy of a human brain. And I'm always amazed when I look at the human brain, how abundant, how high um, volume the white uh, matter occupies. The white matter is really a dominant feature um, of um, higher brains. So now I'm trying to get stuck. No. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, and there had been classical work that looked at the white matter volume um, over time and quantify the changes over time during the lifespan of a human. And uh, what you can see here is that it follows a bell-shaped curve. So it increases to an age of roughly 40 and then it decreases again. So these are MRI measurements of white matter of, in a human lifespan. And this has now recently been done with many more uh, subjects, 10,000 uh, subjects. And uh, essentially it's similar bell-shaped curve was uh, seen. So um, myelin peaks at around the age of 35. So the, the scale is different, but the pattern is very similar. Then it slowly decreases again. And the different colors stand for uh, fe female and male. So today I will talk about oligodendrocytes and mi microglia interactions. I will start with the development um, of the white matter, and then I will move on to aging and to remyelination. Uh, so one question we uh, have had in the lab for a long time is how myelin is formed, um, but I will not talk about this topic today. I will just mention one aspect of this, and this is the role of microglia in this process. Uh, so to study um, myelination, we often use electron microscopy and we try to understand how we get from a pattern shown here on the left to uh, this multi lamellar uh, structure. And we did 3D reconstruction of the growing myelin at different time points of development. And by this, um, we uh, established a model of how we th think and thought that uh, myelin is generated um, by um, the movement of the membrane around the axons. I will not uh, go into details of this work at all. We'll just mention one aspect that we already discovered at that time. And this was an uh, ultrastructural feature of myelin that is usually associated with pathology. And these are these large myelin outfoldings, usually seen the, them in leukodystrophies or different kinds of pathologies. But we found them also in development and they were found here at P10 in the, in the mouse. Um, and then they uh, do decreased um, with time. Now, at that time, we thought um, they might serve as membrane reservoirs for the future growth of the myelin sheet. So we still do not know what the function of these outfoldings are. But we looked in a bit more details um, onto the morphology of myelin. And we discovered that during um, the development here at P10 very early and here P14, you see uh, pathological features, um, uh, abnormalities of myelins 
that uh, start to disappear the older um, myelin gets. So you see an inverse relation of these ultrastructural um, abnormalities that we call it pathological myelin uh, with the progression of myelination. So it seems to be a normal feature of myelination that um, ultrastructural abnormalities are um, seen. Now here is a 3D reconstruction of one myelin sheet and you see here three different focal areas of myelin abnormalities. Um, and uh, we, you can focus in into one of these areas. We did a 3D reconstruction here. Um, and then one can see that there is a cell here and this is a microglia based on the ultrastructural features of the cell um, on EM criteria. And you see that within um, the microglia, there are pieces of myelin. Some of them are simply in the lysosomes and others still have um, are inside of microglia um, and they still have connections to the myelin sheet. So it seems like the microglia is um, attached to the focal areas of uh, degeneration. Um, now, uh, to look at this in more details, we switched to uh, zebrafish and um, we looked at live imaging of microglia um, in um, how they, uh, it, during development of myelination, similar um, experiments had been done previously by Bruce Apple Lab. And I show you here the movie. Um, so you see here in green, the microglia and you have in uh, magenta, you have the uh, myelin and you see how microglia are running uh, through the myelin sheet, are constantly scanning the uh, myelin sheet. Um, now, we observed that the microglia are not eating up entire myelin pieces, but sometimes fragments of myelin were engulfed by microglia and uh, phagocytose. So when I run this movie, you will see this. Here is the microglia. And here is a piece, a fragment of myelin that is being engulfed by a microglial process. And then it's uh, the microglia process retracted um, into, the, into the microglia. Uh, so we co-label microglia by markers of late endosomes and lysosomes. Here we used RAP7 with a, with a marker of late endosomes. And we found that fragments of myelin are found within um, the lysosomes of microglia during the development um, of myelin in zebrafish. And this started around seven days post-fertilization in the zebrafish. Now, a good candidate that could mediate this uptake of myelin fragments by microglia is phosphorylserine. So phosphorylserine is a lipid that is usually at the inner leaflet of the bilayer, but um, it can flip to the outer side and then serve as an eat me signal for phagocytosing cells. So we constructed a transgenic line where we um, labeled a PS sensor, so MFG8, milk fat globular a protein 8 attached to it, um, EGFP, so a soluble form. So when the microglia will secrete this PS sensor, and then while they are scanning the myelin sheet during development, we can then visualize the areas which become decorated by the PS sensor. And you see two areas that are marked by PS sensor. One are um, here uh, protrusions of the myelin sheets, um, so along the myelin sheet. And, but most of the fragments that were labeled were outside um, of the myelin sheet, so not attached to the myelin, but somehow uh, floating around in the extracellular space. So they were marked by markers of myelin and by this PS sensor. So the next question was, is myelin phagocytosis in the, indeed PS dependent? So this is not easy to do because there are many different PS receptors, at least 10 different ones. So there is the group of TAM receptors, MOTK, AXL, all uh, PS receptors, but also TIM1 and TIM4. So to look at this, uh, we decided to knock out uh, PS receptors in combination. So we did this in pools of three and two or single PS receptors. And um, when we knocked out three receptors in combination, so it didn't re really matter which combination it was, but um, three different PS receptors that were expressed in microglia led to a, um, uh, to a reduction of uh, myelin phagocytosis. Um, and some worked also in uh, pairs of two, and we could also 
uh, bring back um, the one PS receptor and by this we could rescue the phenotype. So just summarizing this part, so we think that myelin development, um, both in zebrafish and in mice, uh, is error prone. So um, pathological features are formed, which are cleared away by microglia in a PS dependent matter, manner. So this happens in the mice to around um, an age of P21. And after P21, uh, myelin looks normal. And we have not looked at it in, in details during the whole lifespan, uh, but uh, to our eye, um, it, nothing spectacular happens to myelin until it starts to age. And this happens in a mice around um, uh, the age of 18 months. Then aging uh, starts, and this is associated with myelin degeneration. So this was first noted by Peters um, in non-human primate. Here is a uh, EM picture of a white matter of a non-human primate, where you can see pathological features of myelin. Um, and we also showed that this is true in, um, in mice. Uh, so we see here an example of a myelin fragment that is still attached to the myelin sheet, but has been uh, pinched off from the myelin sheet. And we see that it is part of another cellular ele element. Um, and as I said, this starts at around the age of 18 months and at two years, at 24 months, this is very apparent. Now to see which cells these are, um, we stained uh, microglia and myelin. And indeed we could see that um, there is a small fraction of microglia that contain pieces of myelin um, in the white matter. And again, starting at 18 months and um, uh, accumulating at uh, two years. Now, um, we, have, we and others have observed that there is um, an expansion of the number of microglia in the white matter, so specifically in the white matter and not in the gray matter. And these microglia that um, accumulate in the aging white matter also have more lysosomes. They have a higher number of lysosomes and uh, larger lysosomes, indicating that they are engaged with phagocytic uh, processes. Now, when we look carefully into the microglia and into this um, fragment, myelin fragments, then we can see that uh, sometimes these myelin fragments are associated with structures that um, uh, appear as lipofuscin. So lipofuscin uh, is a heterogeneous amorphous material, which is defined by its autofluorescence uh, properties. And it is a insol it's insoluble material that is in general accumulating in post-mitotic cell, um, like in neurons, but also microglia and cardiomyocytes. And uh, there's almost a linear relationship of the accumulation of lipofuscin and the age um, of a species. Um, so as I said, we found that uh, these myelin uh, fragments sometimes are in contact with lipofuscin. So we thought maybe there are remnants of myelin that remain in the cell as undegradable uh, material. To test this, uh, we performed the microglia isolation protocols. We max sorted microglia uh, from aged uh, brains, and then we isolated from this microglia detergent insoluble material, so sarcosyl insoluble material that is used um, previously to um, isolate li uh, like neurofibular tangles in uh, degenerative diseases. So when we then stain for myelin component here, for example, for the myelin basic protein, we can indeed see that there are aggregates of myelin basic proteins that are associated with this insoluble material. Now, to follow up this work, one important question was to look at what are the cell type specific responses in the aging brain. And to do this, uh, we teamed up with Urs Götze um, in the Institute. So we are now very close collab collaborators. Um, and we devised uh, a protocol or his lab devised a protocol of how to perform a single cell on white matter and gray matter separately. And um, so the protocol is based on the dissociation of white and gray matter and then incubation with actinomyosin D to prevent uh, um, ex vivo transcription, um, um, and then the cells are sorted and uh, subjected to a smart -seek, um, protocol. And when we do this, uh, we could distinguish four um, clusters of microglia. So two are labeled here in, um, 
green and yellow. So these are the homeostatic clusters, but we found uh, a small proportion of activated microglia that were um, enriched in the white matter. And one we call them white matter associated microglia because this one was the one that was specific uh, for the aging white matter. Um, now, when we look at the gene sets that are enriched in the VAMS, that there are four different gene sets. So set four are the homeostatic genes that they are, they are down-regulated but there are three set of genes that are upregulated, and these are the genes involved in phagocy uh, phagosomes, um, antigen processing, uh, translation, um, and so on. So the transcriptional signature of these VAMs is very similar as the DAM response, and I will come back to this aspect um, in a few minutes. Now, the um, smart sec pipeline was based on a few uh, microglia, only thousands of uh, cells. So therefore we also did 10X now with 10 thousands of cells to see if you can re reproduce the finding with the different platforms with more cells. And indeed we found again, these four uh, clusters of uh, cells. Um, and uh, again, the white matter associated with microglia that were specific uh, for the white matter. We used different markers um, of VAMs or DAMs. Um, AXL, Galactin-3, CLEX-7, and IDGAX to see um, if they're indeed uh, specific for the white matter or also found in the gray matter. And we find uh, consistent with our single, uh, single cell sequencing data that they appear at around an age of 18 months um, and they are um, associated with the white matter areas, the corpus callosum, they're sometimes found in um, in uh, basal ganglia areas, but always associated to the white matter tracts. So indeed, we think that this is a reaction of the aging of myelin. The microglia um, clustered sometimes in uh, nodules. Um, and we, as nodules, I refer to a group of microglia, a group of more than three or four different microglia that cluster together. This is a unspecific response of microglia that has been seen previously in different diseases, for example, in the normal appearing white matter in multiple sclerosis, but you can also see nodules of microglia in um, viral infections. You can even see it in autopsy of pe people that died of COVID-19. Um, you can often see clusters, nodules of microglia in the white matter. So uh, this is a probably an unspecific reaction to some kind of damage that occurs um, in the brain. Um, now we used uh, CLEM, so this is a technique to correlate light with electron microscopy uh, to look in more details at these nodules. So the nodules contain um, often uh, my, uh, myelin fragments uh, within the microglia. So we think these are areas which are actively engaged in phagocytosing damaged myelin. And by electron microscopy, we con could, could confirm that there are um, fragments of myelin inside of microglia and areas of myelin destruction. Now, um, I mentioned already the dam. So in a landmark paper by Ido Amit's group, um, he defined um, the uh, dams as two different states, dam one and dam two states. Um, and one of the states depends on um, the activity of TREM2. Um, and further work by um, Butovsky's lab showed that also APOE uh, together with TREM2 are important to form this um, reaction, the DAM2 in diseases. Now, how do VAM and DAM um, relate to each other to do this, uh, to test this? We used models of AD and asked the question, do um, they uh, coexist in these models? And indeed, we can distinguish um, DAMs, um, DAM1 and DAM2, marked here in black and in pink, um, and uh, together with VAMs marked here in red. So they have, uh, they share that the um, homeostatic uh, transcriptional uh, modules are down-regulated. Um, and we see here in the DAM2, the full uh, set of genes uh, fully um, uh, activated while the VAMs only have a partial activation. So we see the VAM as a spectrum within the DAM spectrum, but a partial activation of the DAM spectrum. So if we now do a pathway analysis to compare VAMs and DAMs within the AD model, then we find that pathways that are enriched 
um, in dams are those that are associated with disease like Parkinson and Huntington and Alzheimer come up. Um, so this uh, is also uh, within the term of the dams uh, indicated diseases um, and the VAMs. Um, there are terms like ABC transporters. So these are often lipid transporters, but um, also atherosclerosis and um, inflammatory pathways are relatively enriched in VAMs versus DAMs. Now, I already um, mentioned that, um, that DAMs are TREM2 dependent, um, and therefore we also use TREM2 knockout mice, so H TREM2 knockout mice, um, and we indeed also observed that uh, the VAM formation was completely TREM2 dependent. Uh, in the absence of TREM2, um, there is a, a striking reduction of VAMs in the white matter. And also the formation of nodules in the white matter was completely um, reduced in um, TREM2 knockout animals. And similar results had previously been seen by uh, Christian Haas lab. Um, now, I also already mentioned that ApoE is an important factor to form dams. Therefore, we also looked at aged ApoE um, mice. And uh, now, distinguishing VAMs from dams, uh, there is no influence of ApoE um, in the formation of VAMs in aging. Uh, similar numbers uh, were seen in knockout versus wild type mice. So, with this, I um, come to the next part. So uh, remaining questions that we have is we want to understand, of course, uh, why is there a degeneration of myelin? So we have not made too much progress on this first part. Um, more progress we have made uh, in understanding what are the, um, the responses of oligodendrocytes in the aging white matter. And we want to understand how these um, alterations that we see in the normal um, aging white matter, how do they intermix uh, with diseases like um, multiple sclerosis, in particular, the capacity to remyelinate is one thing, one thing that is interesting to us. So with this, I come to the uh, third part of my talk and uh, to the mechanism of white matter uh, remyelination. So what, what we are interested in is to understand how um, active lesions um, develop um, in general. So these are now active lesions um, from human MS uh, tissue and active lesions are characterized by infiltration of some lymphocytes, but mainly myeloid cells um, and demyelination. Now, um, after they have formed, uh, these lesions can um, evolve in different, um, can take different fates. So either chronic inactive lesions can form. So these are lesions where inflammation has resolved and um, there's no remyelination, but then there are also uh, lesions where um, inflammation has resolved, but uh, remyelination was successful, and these lesions are called shadow plaques. And there is a third type of lesions where the lesions uh, remain chronically inflamed. These are the chronic active lesions or smoldering lesions, they're sometimes called because they tend to even expand these lesions are characterized by, um, by a microglia rim at the edge um, of the lesion. Um, so when we look at um, autopsy cases of MS, and this is work by Hans Lassmann, um, then one interesting aspect of this is the heterogeneity in um, the repair response. So there are um, patients which have almost all lesions repaired. So 84% of the lesions appear as shadow plaques, as um, remyelinated lesions at autopsy. And there are at the other end of the spectrum, there are patients where only 8% of the um, plaques are remyelinated. So therefore, one of the questions we want to solve is uh, to understand the factors that determine lesion recovery. And um, one important factor is aging. This is mainly work by Robin Franklin's lab. And um, so um, what we wanted to, to understand is uh, what is the influence of aging on, uh, on remyelination and are there other factors that impair uh, regeneration? The model we're using is a toxic-based model where we inject 1% um, lysolecithin in the white matter in the corpus callosum or sometimes also in the uh, spinal cord in the white matter. And then we follow the lesions um, at different time points after injections. 
and typical time points are four um, days after injection. So this is the um, maximal uh, lesion where the lesions have the maximal volume. And then um, at 14 DPI, this is a, a time point of active uh, remyelination where lesions have um, partially recovered. And this is how it looks like. So this is a myelin stain and here we injected um, into the corpus callosum. You see this uh, remyelination. So this would be how a lesion would look at 40 PI. And now you have this uh, striking infiltration of IBA positive cells. 90% of these cells are indeed microglia. There are only few cells that are um, uh, cells that come in from the periphery. Um, so summarizing the, um, the effects of um, aging on the uh, phagocyte response, um, just showing you um, this in uh, schematic pictures. So when you look at an early time point of the lesions, we see how the phagocytes infiltrate into the lesion. And this is a time point where myelin is being removed. Um, so myelin um, is destroyed by the lysolecithin and then the phagocytes, the main function of them is to uh, phagocytose the myelin debris. And when they have um, done this, um, then the uh, inflammation resolves. And with the resolution of the phagocytes from the lesion, uh, remyelination uh, starts. So these are inverse processes, and we believe that there are important signals from the microglia that are transferred uh, to the oligodendrocytes that instruct the remyelination process. Now, when we looked at this in aging, we see, as has been described previously, that the remyelination process is uh, delayed and severely impaired. And we find that there is a retention of the phagocytes in the lesion. So the early lesions look very normal uh, with normal number of phagocytes, but um, there is an impairment of the re resolution of the phagocytes from the um, lesions. And what we found is that the phagocytes that remain in these uh, lesions in the aged animals um, are uh, lipid overloaded. So this can be seen by a typical uh, appearance in um, electron microscopy with uh, lots of lipid droplets. So they have an appearance of foam cells and they are crystals that are sometimes in the lysosomes and often also on the surface of the lipid droplets. This was remarkably increased um, in aged animals compared to young animals. Now, uh, when myelin is taken up, the um, myelin has as a major component cholesterol. The cholesterol um, is transferred from the lysosomes to the um, ER, and from the ER, it is first stored in lipid droplets, and then um, these uh, lipid-loaded cells have to be um, freed from cholesterol, and this happens by a transcriptional program that is um, regulated by the LXR transcription factor, um, which has as main target genes the ABC1 transporter, ABCG1 transporter, and APOE. Um, and this pathway is important to unload the um, cells from cholesterol and to load the cholesterol on APOE particles. And this pathway is impaired in aged mice. So um, aged mice have a basal levels which are, um, which, uh, of APOE which are higher, but they fail to respond um, to the uh, higher needs of more APOE. Um, and when we used an LXR agonist, uh, we could fully rescue the phenotype of aged mice. Um, so by the LXR agonist, um, the resolution of the lesion was impaired um, and um, the cholesterol was successfully loaded onto APOE particles. Um, so just to summarize, uh, this work was published now a few years ago. Um, we um, found that um, in normal mice, uh, one bottleneck of, of the phagocytes is to get rid of the large amounts of cholesterol. And for this a pathway that is under the control of LXR is important and APOE is a key factor here. And we find that in the aging brain, this pathway is impaired and this leads to an accumulation of lipid droplets within the cell, um, formation of crystals in the cell, and together uh, this drive a chronic inflammatory response. And we believe that this chronic inflammatory response of microglia uh, impairs the repair process, possibly signals 
to the oligodendrocytes are not uh, transferred properly. Um, now the question is, um, these findings that we had in um, mice models, do they also, are they also true uh, in human multiple sclerosis? So we don't know this. This is difficult to study in uh, human um, MS. Um, but there is one recent study by Daniel Reislab. He performed a single cell RNA sequencing of this chronic active lesion. So I told you about this chronic active lesion that they have a rim of microglia that remain chronically inflamed. So um, they dissected out this rim um, of microglia, performed single cell sequencing, and defined two populations of microglia. One they called microglia foamy because they were um, characterized by lipid metabolizing uh, genes. And another one was called microglia iron. So we believe that the uh, signature of microglia foamy could be a first indication that these uh, cells are indeed uh, have a problem of handling lipids. And as a consequence, maybe the lesions remained chronically inflamed, but possibly there are also many other different reasons. Now, one important parallel that, uh, we, that we can draw between uh, demyelinating lesions compared uh, to, um, is to an atherosclerotic plaque. Now, also in atherosclerotic plaques, you have a similar problem where you have, where there is a, a accumulation of lipids uh, within a deletion. So here you have um, oxidized LDL um, cholesterol, which is taken up by macrophages within the arterial wall. And with time, there's an accumulation of these form cells. This drives chronic inflammation and um, leads uh, to the diseases that are associated with arteriosclerosis. So based on this, we asked the question, um, could it be that the risk factors for arteriosclerosis, could they also be risk factors for poor uh, remyelination? So therefore we fed uh, mice with a, a Western type of diet. So this is a diet that is high in sugar and um, high in fat. And when you put mice on such a um, diet, then within a few weeks, um, they develop um, metabolic uh, dysfunction. They become, become pre-diabetic and uh, develop obesity. And uh, what we want to know is, uh, is this condition um, that is induced by this Western diet, um, does this change um, the remyelination in the lysolexetine model? And um, indeed it does. So when you look at um, early lesions at 40 PI, the lesions look very normal in their size, but the lesion resolution is impaired. So lesions remain larger in the Western diet fed mice, and also the phagocytes remained uh, within the lesion. So there's a failure of resolution of phagocytes uh, from the lesion. Now, is this um, because of a specific component in the diet, or is it simply the condition that is associated with obesity? And to answer this question, we used uh, leptin uh, knockout mice. So these mice are on a normal diet, um, but um, they overfeed and uh, become obese within a short time. And these mice have a very similar phenotype as the Western type uh, fed mice. So the, the, from this we conclude that it's the condition that is associated with um, the obesity that, um, that is um, a block uh, remyelination. Now coming back to the Western diet fed mice, um, so it was surprising to see that the phenotype that we see in the lesions of the Western diet fed mice is very similar as the phenotype um, of the aged mice. So again, we had um, accumulation of myelin debris within the microglia. We had evidence of cholesterol overloading um, of the microglia. You see here um, lipid droplets in the microglia. You see here crystals on the surface um, of these lipid droplets. Um, and as we observed in the aged mice, when we add this LXR agonist to improve remyelination aging, the same was true when we fed um, mice um, on a Western diet and we then treated the mice after, after induction of the lysolecithin uh, lesions um, with um, the LXR agonist, we could fully rescue the phenotype. So lesion recovery was improved. Um, 
phagocytes result from deletion and uh, cholesterol um, metabolism, metabolism was improved. So this raises the question, um, what is the underlying reason for the failure of microglia to clear lipids in lesion? Are there common mechanisms in aging and obesity, or are there specific mechanisms that are only true uh, for obesity and there are others um, that are true for aging? Now, um, when we look at this, um, we um, can when we simplify this in a model, um, then we would divide the microglia in two states. So I will don't want to give microglia now new names again, but um, for the purpose of this talk, I will call them reparative microglia. Um, these are microglia that can efficiently clear lipids um, and then can also transfer the appropriate signals to oligodendrocytes to instruct remyelination. And there's another state of microglia that are dysfunctional in lipid clearance that um, accumulate uh, lipid droplets, and we call them locked-in microglia because we think that they are unsensitive to signals in these acute lesions and do not respond proper, um, by the proper uh, transcriptional program um, uh, in the lesions. So the question was, are there checkpoints that can convert the microglia from one to the other state? Um, so coming back to the Western diet uh, fed mice, so one observation we made was that um, TGF beta ligands um, were um, in lesions of obese mice were um, increased um, in astrocytes and also the downstream signaling um, in microglia um, was increased. So we thought, so this results indicated that there was increased TGF beta signaling in uh, lesions within obese mice. However, these effects were quite small. So the question, are they at all relevant? Now to test this, uh, we first started by using a drug to specifically block TGF beta signaling in these mice. So we induce a lesion and then we add the drug, the TGF beta blocker. Uh, we indeed could see um, an almost full rescue um, of lesion recovery and all other parameters of obese mice. Now, to test this more specifically, uh, we used uh, a knockout mouse where we specifically deleted the TGF beta receptor um, in microglia um, by a tamoxifen inducible protocol. We obtained this uh, mice from Marco Prince. Um, and uh, strikingly, uh, we could fully rescue the phenotype of obese mice um, when, so in the absence of TGF beta signal in microglia, um, lesions recovered better, uh, phagocytes were able to resolve, and lipid clearance uh, was improved. Um, so this shows that TGF beta is one checkpoint, and we think that a high TGF beta tone might keep um, the microglia in a more locked in state um, in, uh, in lesions of obese mice. However, when we uh, use the same protocol of um, blocking TGF beta signaling in aging, we could not see a rescue. So we think that this is a um, this is a pathway that is specific for the condition that is uh, associated with obesity. So therefore, we was look we were looking for um, uh, for other checkpoints that possibly were more general that were hold true both for obesity and for aging, and one that we discovered was uh, TREM2. So you all uh, probably know TREM2. So it's a um, receptor that has been um, for anionic lipids and has been associated with um, Alzheimer's disease, therefore it's widely studied. Um, and it's also a receptor for a myelin, so it recognizes anionic lipid, as I uh, told you. It's not as an essential receptor for myelin phagocytosis because if you reduce TREM2 levels, there are other PS receptors that it can compensate and then can take over myelin phagocytosis. But uh, um, TREM2 has important signaling pathway downstream of the receptors, receptor that are implicated in phagocytosis and also in lipid metabolism. So therefore we were interested particularly in these pathways. Now, um, the uh, signaling of TREM2 is under the control of proteases. So it's believed that the 
um, when the when TRIM2 is activated, um, then the full length protein promotes the signaling downstream of the receptor. However, when protease is cleaved, cleave uh, the receptor at the ectodomain, then um, the signaling is uh, interrupted and the, the downstream um, response is um, reduced. Now, strikingly, when we take uh, a culture of microglia and we um, incubate this cultured microglia with purified myelin debris, and um, we then uh, look at this cleavage, then we see that myelin debris by itself uh, induces a striking cleavage of the TREM receptor. Um, so we believe that this is a kind of a negative feedback. So um, probably the activation of TREM2 is important to induce downstream signaling, to induce phagocytosis, um, lysosomal function, but also lipid metabolism. But at some point, this leads to a cleavage of the receptor as a negative feedback. Now, since we know that in um, these different conditions like aging and obesity, um, that uh, pathways that are important for lipid metabolism are not activated properly, we thought, would it be possible to prevent the cleavage and thereby to prolong the signaling downstream of the uh, receptor? And to do so, we uh, teamed up with Christian Haas and Denali Therapeutics, and they had developed an antibody against this cleavage site. So this antibody blocks TREM2 cleavage. And by um, this antibody, it's possible to prolong the, the downstream signaling um, of TREM2. So we asked the question if um, these antibodies called 49, um, are they able to promote repair in vivo by prolonging the signaling of TREM2 um, in microglia? Um, so we uh, first we used the obesity model. So we fed mice for four weeks with, with, with this Western type of diet. Then we induced lysolecithin lesions um, and we gave then three injections of 49 antibody. Um, and what we observed was indeed that um, the uh, lipid clearance uh, was promoted um, by the 49 antibody. So this was in the obesity model. And then we uh, checked in uh, aging. And also in aging, we found the same result, an improvement of lipid clearance and um, of um, remyelination. Um, so what I've shown you uh, so far is um, that there are uh, two um, checkpoints, that uh, one that is specific for obesity, this is TGF beta signaling, and one that is more general, um, that is also important in aging, and this is uh, TREM2. Now, just at the very end, I will um, uh, move to trend two knockout mouse. So before us, um, Marco Colonna and Laura Piccio had already shown that uh, trend two knockout mouse are um, in a Cuprison model are inhibited in uh, remyelination. And we could um, nicely reproduce this data. So these are uh, 21 DPI lesions. So you see this inhibition um, of remyelination. And so far we have always seen a correlation of poor remyelination and formation of form cells. So we thought, okay, in a TREM2 knockout mouse, we would see the same, an inhibition um, um, or an, an accumulation of, of form cells. But uh, the opposite was true. So here you see um, some form cells in wild types, um, uh, microglia, but in TREM2, uh, we see no form cells. Instead, we see that, micro, uh, that uh, myelin debris accumulates within the microglia, within lysosomes. And um, this was not simply a delay because also at late time points, so two months after lesion induction, still no form cells were formed. So TREM2 mice are severely impaired in forming uh, lipid droplets and form cells in acute models of demyelination, I should say. Um, so this indicates that maybe uh, the formation of form cells and formation of lipid droplets is something protective. And therefore we used mice that are deficient in a central enzyme of forming lipid droplets. So this is the ACAT, SOAT1. So SOAT1 is an enzyme that transfers an ester group to cholesterol, and this is important to store cholesterol as esters in lipid droplets. Now, when you use these mice, then as um, um, 
predicted or as, as um, from, from the function of um, ACAT, uh, no uh, lipid droplets are formed in the microglia. And in addition, um, as seen in the trend two knockout mice, uh, remyelination is severely impaired and there's also retention of phagocytes within the lesions. So with this, I come to my final uh, summary. So we think that uh, myelin debris clearance by microglia in lesions is a multi-step process. The first step is um, uptake of uh, myelin debris. Then uh, cholesterol, so it ha myelin has to be broken down, down by enzymes in the lysosomes, of course, and um, cholesterol cannot be broken down, so it has to be transferred from the lysosomes to the ER, and from the ER, it, uh, it, um, an ester group is transferred on cholesterol and then it's stored in lipid droplets. And the final step is to remove the cholesterol by the reverse cholesterol pathway. Now, um, in trend two knockout mice or in ACAT knockout mice, phagocytosis, so the uptake of myelin uh, still occurs, but myelin accumulates within the lysosomes, free cholesterol builds up in ER. I didn't show you the data. And, uh, and there's a failure of lipid droplets to form. And as a consequence, also remyelination fails. So there are two important uh, buffering system to buffer the toxicity of cholesterol. One is the safe storage in lipid droplets. Um, and then a second step is the removal of free cholesterol by the reverse cholesterol pathway. With this, I'm at the end and I want to acknowledge um, the people that did the work, Minou, um, she did all the work on the development of myelin and the role of microglia in this process. Um, Shima, uh, together with Simon from OS Group and Tukbeck, uh, were working on um, the aspects of microglia and aging. Mar Bosch was uh, doing all the work um, on the effects of um, Western diet and obesity on uh, remyelination. And Ludo and Dirk and Gary worked on um, various asp aspects of aging and microglia. So with this, I'm at the end and thank you very much for your attention.